If you can't handle this part of the experiment, now is the time to leave. Mr. Little looked around the classroom. It's time to separate the real scientists from the wannabes. Chris looked around the room. Some kids looked scared, but none of them moved. Good, Mr. Little said, nodding in approval. I'd like my students to be fully committed. After you have extracted the tooth, you will place it in the Petri dish of Fazgu. And that, he said, rubbing his hands together, is when things start to get interesting. You see, the Fazgu will not only make the tooth stay alive, it will make the tooth believe it is still a part of you. A tooth can believe something? Brooke asked. Well, it can feel that it's inside your mouth, Mr. Little said. The Fazgu is very powerful. When you touch it, it creates a tendril, a connection that slowly pulls red blood cells from your body. The blood cells can, uh, feed the Fazgu and fuel the experiment. And here's the amazing part. Over the course of several hours, nourished by just a few of your blo red blood cells, your tooth will grow gums, will form a full mouth, and that mouth will open up and tell you something that I promise, no matter how old you live to be, you will never forget. Chris looked around at his classmates, all of whom were wearing an identical look of disbelief. You'll see, Mr. Little said, looking around at all the stunned faces. It will be amazing. Once the mouth has told you what you need to know, it will die. Okay, I'm assuming this is where the, the name he told me everything <laughs> uh, comes from. Um, I have provided a biohazard bag in each cubicle. You will dispose of the mouth and the fazgu in the bag. After you have brought me the bag so I can dispose of it correctly, you are free to go. Mr. Little looked toward the classroom door and smiled. But first, pizza! He waved for the pizza delivery guy to come in. You have 30 minutes to eat, drink and socialise, Mr. Little said. But after that, it's time to get to work. Chris grabbed a couple of cheese slices and a paper cup of soda and sat down with Sam, Brooke and Malcolm. I guess this will be the last pizza I chew with my left back molar. Malcolm said, but he sounded more amused than scared. I'm a little worried pulling one of my teeth will mess up my orthodontia. <laughs> Brooke, who had a mouthful of braces, said, Oh my gosh, she has to do it with braces? Uh, yeah, your, orthodonti your orthodontist is going to be mad, Sand said. Will your parents be mad too when they find out? Brooke shrugged. Not if I tell them that it was a science club assignment. They let a They'd let me saw off my own arm if they thought it would improve my chances of getting into a good college. My parents would too, Malcolm said, and they all laughed. They'd let me saw off both my arms if it would get me into the Ivy League. My mum would be totally mad, Sandstead. Uh, Brooke laughed. Oh, she will, won't she? I forgot. Forgot what? Chris said. Brooke laughed some more, but managed to get out. Sand's mum is a dentist. After they laughed some more, Malcolm said, that reminds me, Chris, I don't believe you said what your parents do for a living. Chris felt a flutter of panic in his belly. He couldn't possibly tell them that his mum was a cashier when people paid their electric bills and that his dad fixed people's cars. Um, my mum is an electrical engineer and my dad is a mechanical engineer. Wow, two engineers for parents, Sand said. You must be really good at math. Chris nodded. This part, at least, was true. Okay, Mr Little called. Time to get to work, scientists. Chris was glad that he hadn't revealed to Sam, Malcolm and Brooke that he was going to perform the experiment without having to pull his own tooth. He couldn't let anybody know that he had figured out a way to game the system. Chris entered his cubicle and filled the Petri dish with Fazgu as instructed. Within a couple of minutes, he could hear grunts and groans as the students in the other cubicles laboured to pull out their teeth. In the cubicle nearest him, he heard a scream followed by a sickening popping sound as the tooth released from its roots. Chris figured that for the sake of realism, he should grunt and groan a little too. He faked it for a few minutes, very believably, he thought, and then he reached into his pocket and pulled out his ace in the hole. The sight of his mum about to pull his sister's tooth the other night had made him remember that when he was little, he had declined money from the tooth fairy in order to keep uh, all his old baby teeth. He didn't know why he hadn't been willing to let them go, especially for cash, which was hard to come by in this family. He had been a weird little kid, but now that weirdness was paying off. Chris submerged his old baby tooth in the faz goo. When he touched the goo, he felt he, he sorry he thought he felt a slight sucking sensation in his fingertips. He pulled his hand away, but a tendril of pink slime connected his index finger to the petri dish with his tooth in it. 
The tendril was stretchy, like mozzarella cheese when you lift the first slice from a hot pizza. Now there was nothing to do but wait for the tooth to get what it needed from him. He lay down on the cot, making sure not to break the tendril that connected his finger and the fazgu. Chris closed his eyes and let himself doze. Soon he was dreaming of future successes. He saw himself as though he were a character in a movie, opening the letter granting him a full scholarship to an Ivy League university. He saw himself doing research in a lab at the university. The lab was bright and clean and filled with the most cutting-edge equipment. A distinguished professor in a white lab coat stood behind him and looked over his shoulder, smiling at the good work he was doing. Chris saw himself in a black cap and gown, walking across a stage. The university professor handed Chris his diploma, and Chris smiled to have his picture taken. But when Chris smiled, it was immediately clear that something was wrong. Blood dripped from his lower lip down to his chin. His mouth was a black cavern framed by a bloody mess of gums. Somebody had pulled all of Chris's teeth. Oh my god! Oh! Oh! <laughs> Chris startled awake. Oh yeah, this is... <laughs> Sorry, I kind of zoned out and I forgot it was a dream. Yeah, Chris started awake. <laughs> Silly me, of, of course. I'm the only person who would do that, who would forget that that was a dream. I have really bad short-term memory loss. Um, he was disorientated uh, at first, waking up on a narrow cot in a cubicle, but then he saw the tendril was strung between his finger and the Petri dish and remembered where he was and why. Sitting up, Chris heard movement and whispering coming from the other cubicles. Could the whispering be coming from the mouth that this experiment was supposed to create? Chris presses his ear into the petition in hopes of making out what was being said, but no words were discernible. From where he was, the whispering just sounded like the soft whooshing of wind through trees. But then he heard the voice of the student in the cubicle next to his. Wow, she said, her voice filled with awe. Wow. There was a rattle of plastic which could have been the biohaz uh, bio biohazard bag, then the sound of footsteps. Chris pushed one of his cubicle's partitions open just a crack so he could watch the student leave. It was Brooke, but the look on her face was different than her new usual smart, collected expression. Somehow, her features seemed softer, more open. Her eyes were wide with and full of wonder. She walked up to Mr. Little and handed him the biohazard bag. Brooke rested her hand on Mr. Little's forearm and looked him in the eyes. She told me everything, Brooke said. Mr. Little smiled. Good. Nice work, Brooke. You're free to go. Brooke smiled back at Mr. Little and wandered through toward the door. Chris was about to close the small opening in the petition where he saw another student, a tall, dark-haired boy he hadn't met yet, emerge from a cubicle across the room. Just like Brooke, he wore an expression of amazement. He walked up to Mr. Little and handed him the biohazard bag. He told me everything, the boy said, placing his hand on Mr. Little's shoulder. Mr. Little smiled and nodded. Good. Nice work, Jacob. You're free to go. Thank you, the boy said, as though Mr. Little had just given him a gift. Chris closed off the partition. Clearly, the experiment was starting to work for some people. But when he checked the progress in his Petri dish, he didn't see any significant change. It was still just his old baby tooth submerged in a puddle of fazgu. What if my experiment doesn't work? Chris wondered. What if I fail? Ever since middle school, when his class visited the high school science fair and Chris saw the amazing experiments conducted by Mr. Little's students, Chris had dreamed of being in science club. What if he didn't belong there? What if he lacked the necessary knowledge and skill? So many of the science club kids were the sons and daughters of scientists themselves, or of doctors, or lawyers, or college professors. Chris was the son of a clerk and a labourer. Maybe he wasn't of the right stock to make the grade in this intellectual environment. Suddenly, Chris felt drained, depleted. Maybe this meant the Fazgu was draining him of all the energy it needed to make the experiment work. Or maybe it was just the feeling of him giving up hope. Uh, either way, he was exhausted. He lay down on the cot again and fell asleep instantly. Chris woke up groggy with his face in a puddle of his own drool. His surroundings were strangely quiet. No whispering, no sounds of movement. He sat up and wiped away the drool. The, den the tendril on his index finger reminded him to check his experiment's progress. Maybe it was finally working. He tried to muster up some hope. The goo had outgrown the Petri dish. It didn't look like a mouth or much of anything else, really. It was a pink blob, slimy and unpleasant, about the size of a baby's fist. It was something, anyway. 
He just wasn't sure what. Around him, the room was still quiet. Had everybody else left? After a few seconds, Chris heard rustling, then footsteps, then a voice saying, he told me everything, followed by Mr. Little's praise and permission for the student to go. Chris sighed and sat on the cot and waited. He watched the mass in the Petri dish, but if there was any progress, it was too slow to see. It was it was akin to watching paint dry or grass grow. Permission to enter, a voice said from outside the partition. Sure, Chris said. Mr. Little stepped into the cubicle. How's it going, Chris? Uh, I'm not sure, to be honest. Am I the last person left? Mr. Little smiled. No, there are a few other stragglers. I'm just making the rounds and checking up on everybody's progress. He nodded in the direction of the table. May I? Of course. Chris felt nervous for Mr. Little to look at his nowhere near finished project. Mr. Little approached the table and looked at the blob, cocking his head in a way that reminded Chris of the family dog. Hmm, Mr. Little said, leaning down and squinting over the Petri dish. Very curious. Did I do something wrong? Chris asked. He knew where he had gone wrong, even though he wouldn't admit it to Mr. Little. He should have followed directions and pulled out one of his teeth on the spot like the rest of the students did. He had taken the easy way out because he was a coward, and now he was reaping the consequences. As experiments go, this one is pretty impossible to mess up, Mr. Little said, rubbing his chin. You did put one of your teeth in there, didn't you? Yes, sir, Chris said, not elaborating on the age of origin of tooth not elaborating on the age or origin of the tooth. Well sometimes in science we just have to admit that we don't know why things are happening as they are. The way I see it, Chris, you've got two choices. You can end the experiment and say it just didn't turn out for whatever reason, dispose of whatever the thing is you've got there and go home and play video games or whatever you do on your own time. He smiled. Or you can acknowledge that something interesting is happening here, even if we don't quite know what it is, and give it some more time to see what happens. Chris didn't have to ask himself which choice a real scientist would make. I'd like to give it some more time if that's okay. Mr. Little smiled and clapped him on the back. It's more than okay. I admire your patience. It's an excellent quality for a scientist to have. Most scientist endeavours worth uh, doing require... Uh, worth doing require a great deal of patience and determination. He looked back at the blob. And to be honest, I'm glad you made that choice because I'm pretty curious to see how this turns out myself. He gave Chris a little two-fingered salute. I'll check back later, okay? Okay, thank you, sir. Chris felt relieved. He made the right choice and he had uh, received Mr. Little's approval. Maybe he could be a real science club member after all. He sat down to wait because that's what scientists did. After a while, there was more movement and rustling, followed by similar words uttered by different voices. He told me everything. She told me everything. He told me everything. Each time there was a little uh, Mr. Little's approval for the student to leave. And then there was silence. Finally, feeling like the last person on earth, Chris called Mr. Little. Yes, Chris. Am I the only one left? You are. His tone was pleasant. No worries, though. Should I give up so you can go home? Chris wondered if Mr. Little had a wife and some little littles waiting on him, wondering why the lock-in was taking so long. Mr. Little poked his head inside of the cubicle. Of course not. I've got no place to be, and if you're willing to wait, so am I. He grinned and gave a thumbs up. Patience and determination. Once Mr. Little had disappeared from view, Chris felt another wave of exhaustion. Hoping that the energy draining from him was being funneled into the little pink blob, he lay back down on the cot and lost consciousness immediately. When he awoke, he gasped at the sight on the table. The mass had more than quintupled in size and it was now far too large to fit inside the biohazard bag. It was still slimy and pink, but it was no longer an inert blob. Shaped somewhat like a limbless human torso, it was now pulsing with life. Oh yeah, I see what's happening, Scott. I see it, I see it. <laughs> oh god. Uh, Chris felt excited, but also a little fearful as he approached his creation. The way it expanded and contracted made him feel like something might jump out like a creature he saw in a horror movie once. He stood over the pulsing mass. Its skin, if you could call it that, was a translucent pink, like a bubble brown from bubblegum. Beneath it was the source of the pulsing, a cluster of bag-like structures that were beating to a rhythm that seemed strangely familiar, though Chris didn't know why. Chris looked at the tendril, now thicker and stronger, that connected him to the newly formed organism on the table. The tendril pulsed in unison with the strange thing's organs. Chris gasped when he realised why the pattern of this pulsing seemed so familiar. The thing's organs and the tendril that connected him 
uh, him to it with the throbbing with the beat of Chris's own heart. A shudder ran through him, and he was overcome with the sudden need to empty his bladder. Now that he thought about it, he realised he hadn't gone to the bathroom for hours, not since right after the school's uh, dismissal bell rang. This knowledge increased his sense of urgency. But how could he manage to go down the hall to the boys' restroom uh, Sorry, when he was physically connected to this big, weird, seemingly living thing? He wondered how the other kids had managed it. They probably hadn't needed to go in the first place because he, they had completed the experiment so much more quickly than he had. Plus, their experiments had, hadn't yielded hasn't yielded something so large and unwieldy. Just as Chris decided he, that he was desperate enough to call for Mr. Little and make the pathetic confession that he needed to use the restroom but didn't know how, the pressure in his bladder disappeared. He looked over at the thing on the table which expelled a large amount of fluid that hit the floor with a splash. Oh my god. <sighs> wow. Was this that, was that his pee? And um, what was it doing over there? Chris knew he should have been embarrassed. He was pretty sure he had just peed on the floor of his science classroom, after all a big no-no if there was there ever was one. But mostly he was just confused. Wasn't his pee supposed to come out of his own body? He looked at the tendril. Now even thicker and stronger, it was a tube connecting his body to the thing, feeding like it was the umbilical cord that connects a mother with her unborn baby. Maybe his pee had travelled from him through the tube to be expelled by the thing on the table. But why? He watched the thing pulse some more. Whatever it was, he didn't like it, and he didn't like being connected to it. He didn't like knowing he was letting it leech his energy so it could grow bigger and stronger while he grew more exhausted and weak. It was time to cut the cord. The problem was, he didn't have anything to cut it with. He looked around the almost empty cubicle and spotted the unused pliers. They weren't as good as a knife or a strong pair of scissors, but they were still better than trying to sever, uh, sever the cord with his bare hands. He could use the pliers to grip and squeeze the cord, then give it a hard yank to tear it apart and break the connection. He poised the pliers to grab the tendril just above where it connected with his left index finger. Then he squeezed. It felt like somebody was choking the life out of him. Pinching the tube cut off his air supply somehow, and he fell to the floor, gasping, landing in a puddle of what was most certainly his own urine. He released the tendril from his pliers, and his breath started to come back. He was too lightheaded to get up quickly, so he lay on the wet floor for a few minutes, panting like an overheated dog. Was there no way to end the connection between him and the disturbing result of the experiment, or were he and his creation bound together like conjoined twins who shared a vital organ? He pulled himself up and willed himself to look at the mass on the table. The torso had lengthened, and the small pink buds were visible where the arms and legs should have been. Somehow, while he hadn't been watching it, a neck and a head had formed. The head was hairless, featureless, horrifying. Chris backed away slowly, bumping into the cot. He didn't want to look at the thing anymore, but he couldn't look away either. It radiated a horrible fascination, like a gory accident on the side of a highway. He sat on the cot and looked at it until he realised his vision had become blurry and indistinct. It was strange. He had never felt, uh, he had never had trouble with his eyes before. He put his hand over his right eye, and suddenly it was like the world had been plunged into blackness. He, re he reached up to put his hand over his left eye, and what he found there made him cry out, of, out in horror. His left eye was gone. Huh. It was impossible, of course. The loss of red blood cells and his level of anxiety must have been disrupting his perceptions, making him paranoid, making him think he was hallucinating. He reached up for his left eye again, but felt only the gaping empty socket. Impossible, he told himself again. But then he looked up at the tendril. Inside the translucent tube, an orb travelled away from Chris and toward the evolving pink form on the table. The orb was being pushed along by the tendril's pulsations. It was the size and shape of a human eyeball. What the? Chris's hand shot up to where his eyeball used to be. There was a popping sound like a cork being pulled from a bottle. And when Chris looked over at the thing on the table, it was looking back at him with Chris's left eye. The face was no longer featureless. It was now cycloptic. <laughs> oh, God. Chris knew the creature wouldn't be content to stay, a to stay a cyclops for long. It would be coming for his other eye, and for more parts of him as well. Even without the benefit of having both of his eyes, Chris could see things clearly now. I can see clearly now, I've got eyes. Uh, <laughs> the organs that throbbed beneath the creature's translucent skin were his organs, or they used to be. 
he was being used as a living organ donor for this thing. But he wouldn't be a living or a living donor for much longer. With his vital organs being siphoned through the tube one by one, he couldn't have much time left. Chris pulled on the tendril, trying to rip it from his body, but it was connected as solidly as his fingers were to his hand, and gripping the tube constricted it and made him lose his breath. He tried to get up with a vague, hopeless thought of running to where it used it, uh, to where he could get help, even if it meant dragging the thing behind him like a broken kite on a string, but he found himself too weak to stand. But he still had a voice, didn't he? There was nothing to do but scream. Help! He yelled with a voice that was thinner and weaker than he would have liked it to be. Help! Mr. Little! Anybody! I'm over here! Help me! His cries for help were met with silence. Now that all the other students had gone home, had Mr. Little gone home too? Would he have left without saying goodbye, without giving Chris permission to leave as well? Chris could not remember ever having felt so utterly alone. The yelling had tired him out. Everything tired him out. His muscles felt non-existent, and his arms and legs were as floppy as overcooked noodles. He sank down on the cot. He needed to think of a plan, a way to escape, but weakness and fatigue overtook him. He didn't mean to fall asleep, but he wasn't strong enough to fight the wave of exhaustion that swept over him. When he awoke, he opened one, his one eye and saw the thing sitting on the edge of the table across from him. Except it wasn't just a thing anymore. It was a boy. A boy who, except for a strangely pink skin tone, looked exactly like Chris. It was Chris's height and build, with his sandy brown hair. It was wearing Chris's clothes and looking at Chris with what had once been his left eye. Did that mean Chris was naked? He looked down at his reclining body and quickly saw that it didn't have enough structural integrity to support clothes. Chris's body was devoid of muscles and bone. He was just a mass, a blob. He had no idea how he could still be alive, how he could still be aware with so much, with so little of him left. There was no way he could hold out much longer. Chris understood that he would never see his mum and dad and Emma again. He would never take another bike ride to the dairy bar and the lake with Josh and Kyle. Somebody else would have to take pork chop for his walks and feed him his dinner. The thing got down from the table and used Chris's bones and muscles to walk over to the cot. With his one remaining eye, Chris saw his creation. He saw that his creature looked so much like him that nobody would ever know the difference. It would go to Chris's house and take its place in Chris's family. It would sit at the dinner table with his mum and dad and Emma, eating hot dogs and macaroni and cheese. It would play with pork chop. It would study at Cool Beans Coffee and go to school and science club meetings. Chris saw that his own life was going on without him. Chris struggled to speak. His throat and mouth were as parched as a desert, and he was pretty sure his lips were gone. It was hard to make himself heard. Listen, his voice finally came out as a croak. My mum and dad, they're going to love you because they love me. Be nice to them. He stopped to try and catch his breath. Breathing used to be so easy, he never even thought about it. Be nice to my sister too, she's a good kid. A Girl Scout, she's your sister now. The words were hard to get out, but he had more he needed to say. Mrs Thomas, our neighbour, she's old, she's a nice lady, help her when you can, and play with pork chop. The creature furrowed its brow, looking confused. I am to play with a pork chop? <laughs> I love that voice. Uh, Chris felt the last of his strength fading. He whispered, Porkchop is my dog. Yours, now. Chris felt the tendril that connected him to his life disintegrating. Take care of him, he said. But his words came out so softly he was afraid that only he could hear him. Chris felt a, a strange sensation of suction where his right eye was, and then everything went black. He listened as his eyeball was sucked through the tube. There were more slurping sounds too, as other parts of him were drawn up through the tendril, parts he knew he couldn't live without. He was like the, it was like the creature was drinking him, sucking the last of his organs through a long straw, like the dregs of a milkshake, leaving only an empty vessel. Chris, as the creature would have to learn to call itself, stood over the shapeless mass of empty flesh on the cot. He opened the biohazard bag and stuffed the, fla uh, the fleshy remains of the experiment inside of it. He was surprised that he was able to cram all of it into one bag, and when he picked it up, the contents were surprisingly light. It left the cubicle and found Mr. Little sitting at his desk, drinking from a styrofoam cup of coffee and munching on a donut. Well, good morning, Chris, Mr. Little said, standing up and brushing crumbs from his moustache. You had a long night, didn't you? But don't keep me in suspense. Did you finally complete the experiment? Did you get the results you wanted? 
The new Chris's eyes were wide and full of wonder. Soon he would be stepping out of the classroom and out of the school and into the world for the first time. Chris handed the biohazard bag to Mr. Little. He looked into the teacher's eyes and smiled. He told me everything, he said. As Chris walked outside the school building, the sun was warm on his face. The sky was blue, the clouds were white and fluffy, and birds chirped in the trees. Chris smiled. It was a beautiful day. Oh my god, okay. That's creepy. That's creepy. That's very good. I like that. Um, gives me uh, Lonely Freddy vibes, of course, uh, for very obvious reasons. Also kind of gives me the new, um, yeah, the new kid vibes. Um, because of, um, you know, the ending, um, where, like, Kelsey is, it's really hard to explain, uh, I don't know how to explain the ending to you, but, like, Kelsey starts a new life, um, as, like, possibly in a new body, it's so strange, oh my god, I really like this, I, I just wonder what all these stories are trying to tell us about the law, if anything, uh, I mean, it was a very good story, but if there's any lore aspects, I have no idea what. Um, something transforming into something else? Huh. I don't know. I really don't. Um, but the story as a whole, that's my favourite of the cliffs, definitely. Um, that, that was definitely my favourite. Um, it was a very good story. Um, it, it must be one of my favourites. It must be up there. If you guys want to, by the way, if you guys want to see me do, like, me rating all the stories, um, then I will, I will do that. Um, actually, I might do that this week. Uh, I might do, uh, me rating all of the Fazbear Fright stories from best to worst, you know, uh, or a tier list. Um, anyway, that was such, that was a very, very good story. I am baffled at how good that was, um, and how creepy it was. Um... I don't, I, I just can't think of any law significance. I just can't. I'm so glad that it, it doesn't look like it's Chris Afton. I'm so happy with that. <laughs> Imagine if Chris Afton was a thing. Anyway, that is it for, um, he told me everything. Um, that he told, oh, that's, that's a theory I have about this story in particular. Sorry, I, I know I'm going to continue for a while, but... That's theory, because what if, just hear me out, what if every child went through the same thing? Hmm? Wouldn't that be so weird? Because technically we don't know if, um, if the other children uh, went through the same thing or not. Um, but that could be a possibility. The reason I don't think... That, that is going to be the actual thing is because everybody else put in a tooth, uh, their real tooth, and um, Chris put in his finger with his baby tooth. Um, so it, it was like his fault. Um, but yeah. Uh, anyway, I've got to end it. I've got to end it. Um, the next story I'm doing is, of course, the stitch race. And then that is the cliffs done in two days. In two days, I <laughs> finished an entire book. I'm so happy with that. Um, the Stitch Wraith is actually a really, really long Stitch Wraith story this time. So I'm going to be excited to read that. Anyway, we will be reading that very soon. And I will see you then. Goodbye.